Our guest on This is America and the World is Dr. Deepak Chopra. Through his efforts as founder of the Chopra Foundation and Chopra Global, Deepak Chopra has worked for years to promote the effects of mind-body practices on positive health and well-being. Dr. Chopra now offers his personal guidance on a new app, Digital Deepak, and he's the author of the recently published Total Meditation, Practices in Living the Awakened Life. Dr. Chopra, good to see you once again. Thank you very much. It's always good to be with you. During the pandemic, how did you navigate? Are you okay? Yeah, in fact, I think I reinvented my body and resurrected my soul and uh, hopefully shared some insights with my uh, global audience as well. One of the things I gathered that you did during the pandemic was work on the new book, Total Meditation. I did, and I also worked on other things, especially my nonprofit on mental health and well-being and suicide prevention and a lot of other initiatives. But yeah, the book was very important. When you say you resurrected your body, you resurrected your soul, what do you mean by that? reinvented my body, resurrected my soul. Ah. So, you know, uh, reinvented my body, you know. I've said for the last uh, 45 years that uh, your body is not a noun, it's a verb. And more than that, your body is the most abstract thing you can imagine. In fact, your mind is more concrete and what we call the soul consciousness is the only reality but the body is a changing activity that we know or experience as sensations and perceptions and feelings and thoughts the body mind is a single unit just like wave uh, and particle are a single unit or mass and energy are a single unit or um, Uh, space and time are a single unit, body-mind are a single unit. Nothing that happens in the mind is not noticed by the brain or the body. And of course, the body is how we navigate our experience of the world. So this year, what I did was I actually said, I've been saying this for 40 years. Let me do it. And so over the last maybe two years or three years, I've been practicing various uh, techniques, which include deep rest, including good sleep, but also um, mind-body coordination with yoga and breathing and uh, exercise and vagal stimulation. And uh, following a diet that is healthy for my microbiome, which is the 2 million extra genes we have on top of the 25 genes that our parents gave us. So in short, uh, you know, I lost 50 pounds over three years consciously. I, uh, my blood pressure now is 110 by 70. I have the biological markers of somebody who's half my age. And so that's how I reinvented my body. And when I say resurrected my soul, I took a long time this last year to address the global pandemic of grief, not the global pandemic of, uh, of COVID-19 or the financial crisis, but grief as we looked across the human landscape. And I'm a physician, so I've seen a lot of grief over the years. And I find people in different stages of grief. Some are angry, some are victimized, some are hostile, some have made this uh, political issue, but um, all the way, what you see is a common thing called grief. Grief happens when we lose something that we took for granted. And so we took life for granted. Uh, I didn't. I have always been uh, of the opinion that if you're not perpetually surprised by your existence, then your humanity is not complete. So I saw this landscape of hostility and anger and resentment and helplessness and frustration. At the same time, I saw some people 
who found acceptance and meaning and even opportunity. We we're talking on Zoom, I think. Mm -hmm. Somebody saw that opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, vaccine. And a lot of other very interesting things are happening right now in the world of technology and what I focus on, which is the future of well-being. So that's what I do. When you use the word grief, but then you also mm -hmm. seem to make it synonymous with uh, anger, uh, that's a little difficult for us to understand. See, uh, what happens, I'll tell you, as physicians, we see grief all the time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you see a patient with a heart attack who knows that they're going to die. You know, there are all kinds of sirens and alarms and pacemakers and codes and the patient you can see is in panic unfortunately and i've seen some of them angry why me some victimized some even hostile it's natural when you lose something that you took for granted you go through these stages very few people find acceptance and those who find acceptance have actually uh, labored a lot through the years on self-reflection, meaning, purpose, um, and asking big questions like, you know, who am I and what's my deepest desire? Do I have a calling? What's my purpose? Uh, what am I grateful for? And I, I saw people in all these different stages, in pe including people who, you know, I see people who have cancer and they say, I'm grateful. It changed my life. Yeah. So, you know, humans are, interesting. we have different responses to the same situations, depending on our conditioning. Let us uh, take a little break back on the other side. We're talking with Dr. Deepak Chopra. This is America and the World. Underwriting for This is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C., featuring the 29th National Japan Bowl, a Japanese language and culture competition. The National Association for Children of Addiction, Faces and Voices of Recovery, The Forerunner Foundation, The Rotondaro Family Trust, The Republic of Uzbekistan, The Sultanate of Oman, The Kingdom of Morocco, and the Embassy Series, Uniting People Through Musical Diplomacy. Deepak, if we turn the clock back to the 1980s, and you were a uh, young doctor practicing in uh, Massachusetts, uh, I'm sure for a young doctor, lots of stress. Uh, what, could you compare the lifestyle that you were living then and that kind of a stressful situation with where you are today. Yes, so actually go back a little further in the 70s. I started my internship in 1970. And throughout the 70s, I was in training as a resident, as a fellow, as a research assistant, as somebody who was teaching at BU, Harvard, Tufts, etc. And yes, I was stressed. I had 30 patients uh, outpatient, 30 patients inpatient, mm. 20 patients in the ICU, and uh, smoking cigarettes, uh, drinking alcohol to excess on Fridays at least, and totally burnt out. It was in the 80s, specifically 1980, that uh, my lifestyle changed because I, you know, I remember resuscitating a patient, putting a pacemaker in, going outside the hospital and smoking a cigarette. Mm. And, you know, I also had patients who were on respirators. You took them off the respirator. They would smoke through their tracheostomy tube. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was my lifestyle. When, uh, so, so nowadays, life is as complex uh, fast-paced life filled with lots of distractions as a country as a, as a, as a, if you if you did a common denominator of the 330 million people how are we doing not well you're on a scale of 1 to 10 if 8 9 and 10 is thriving and if 6 7 is struggling and if 5 is less 
less than five or less is suffering, we are suffering. We are um, suffering as, as a nation, we are suffering as a global society. And there are many reasons. And not, it's not just the pandemic, it's you know, social injustice, racial injustice, gender injustice, war, terrorism, climate chain, uh, change, uh, poison in our food uh, chain, extinction of species, mechanized ways of killing each other. Everybody wants to make nuclear weapons, cyber hacking. You know, if you actually looked at this soberly, you would say it's insanity. I mean, what we're seeing right now is a sleepwalking collectively towards uh, extinction. I'm sorry to say that, but you know, climate change is the biggest crisis and it's connected to everything else that we're happening, that is happening right now in the world. Even the pandemic, by the way, once it's over, we'll need to address how a stress genetic ecosystem can give rise to mutations like the one we're seeing right now. You discovered meditation a long time ago, uh, but you make a distinction between meditation, taking a break, calming down, and total meditation, which you say is a lifestyle, a journey. Talk about that, huh? Okay, so you know, meditation became popular in the United States in the 1950s, although it was brought to this country from various Eastern traditions a long time ago, and it's been part of the Western meditation traditions, including centering prayer and many of the um, Christian traditions as well. But it became popular in the 50s uh, because it was felt to be a panacea for stress management which it is. Mm -hmm. But then later, people saw biological effects uh, of meditation in the direction of self-regulation and self-healing. We did some of the earlier research where we collaborated with a Nobel Prize winner, Elizabeth Blackburn, and we were able to show that in one week of a meditation retreat, people's gene activity changed. All the genes that are responsible for self-regulation, homeostasis, uh, they went up some 17 fold. The enzyme telomerase, which regulates our genetic clock for aging, went up in our study by 40%, but other people have replicated. Elizabeth, who discovered the enzyme and got the Nobel Prize for it, ended up writing a book called The Telo Telomere Effect. So the effects, biological effects are known and validated. The psychological effects are known and validated. Mm -hmm. The emotional resilience that comes from meditation is validated. But the original intent of meditation was to get in touch with the source of all experience. By experience, I mean perceptions, thoughts, feelings, emotions, imagination, creativity, insight, intuition, inspiration, a higher calling, and transcendence, none of which is actually talked about. Um, I wrote Total Meditation as a lifestyle so we could actually understand who we are. Are we the changing experience of the body? If you say I'm the body, then which one? You started as a fertilized ovum, you became a zygote, an embryo, a baby, a toddler, etc., a young adult, and one day you're going to die. So which body do you have? Every year, your body is a new body. 98% of the atoms are replaced. You say, I'm my mind, which mind? You don't have the same mind as a teenager, as you have now. Even your personality is evolving. There's something deeper that spiritual traditions call the soul, which is an unfashionable word these days because we live in a secular society. But cognitive scientists today are asking, what is fundamental reality? Is it consciousness or is it physical? And there's a whole movement now that says, if you want to solve the hard problem of consciousness, we might want to look at some of the spiritual traditions that talk about this deeper level of being that we call awareness. And so awareness is fundamental reality because without awareness, there's no experience. We are having this experience because you and I are conscious beings. 
So I wrote Total Meditation to help people shift their identity from the body mind to the level of awareness, uh, which if you want to call it spirit, soul, that's fine. Or you can just say core consciousness, conscious beings, we have self-awareness, like unlike other species that are totally instinctual, we have an intellect, we have an ego identity, but we have something deeper where we are aware of our body, our mind, our emotions. So what is it that's in the back of all this? That's why I wrote Total Meditation. It's about spiritual freedom, going beyond the conditioned mind. You use and The mind is conditioned for thousands of years, economics, history, race, religion, all of that. You used a, a, a phrase or a word, sleeping, and I gather that you are suggesting that we're, most of us going through life, going through it by the numbers. And what you're saying is uh, too many people are asleep and you are suggesting a message of wake up. And you use, the word, you use the word awareness. Help us understand what you mean by awareness. Awareness is that which makes any experience possible. You cannot have a thought without being aware. You cannot have a feeling. You can't have a perception. You can't have this conversation. So awareness is fundamental to any experience. It's prior to experience. Now, in the West, Descartes used the phrase, I think, therefore I am. With all due apologies, <laughs> he was wrong. I am, therefore I think. I am precedes every experience. So, and that, by the way, is not a new idea. In the Bible, when Moses addresses the burning bush, he says, God, what's your name? The answer is, I am that I am. Psalm 44 says, be still and know that I'm God. Now, I, I recognize God is not a fashionable word, again, in the secular society we live in, but there's a deeper creative intelligence that orchestrates the activity of the body right now. What is What are you doing right now to control your blood pressure or regulate your immune system or regulate your breathing or heart rate? Nothing. It's happening automatically. What are you doing to breathe right now? It's happening. There's a creative intelligence that orchestrates the activity of the mind, the body, and our raw experience of the world is just sensations, perceptions, images, feelings, thoughts. Now in cognitive literature, these are called qualia. Qualia means qualities of awareness. So if I asked you, what is this? You'd probably say it's a book. But if you're a baby, you, you wouldn't know that, you know? And if you, I asked you to read this because you speak English and you read English, it makes sense to you. But if you only know Swahili, it doesn't make any sense. It's squiggles. Raw experience, even perception has no meaning. It's colors, shapes, forms. Humans give meaning to experience and that's how we construct our everyday reality. And we do it in awareness without recognizing it. And we do it in a way that's unconscious because of our conditioning. So when I said sleep, Wittgenstein, the German philosopher, he said, we are asleep. Um, our life is a dream. Um, but once in a while, we wake up enough to know that we are dreaming. The Buddha said the same thing. He said, this lifetime of ours is transient as autumn clouds. To watch the birth and death of beings is like looking at the movements of a dance. Uh, a lifetime is like a flash of lightning in the sky, rushing by like a torrent down a steep mountain. So if I asked you, Dennis, what happened to your childhood? It's a dream. But what happened to yesterday? It's a dream. What happened to this morning? It's a dream. What happened to five minutes ago? It's a dream. What happens to these words by you? The time you hear them, they don't exist. So we go through our entire life sleepwalking when reality is here right now in this moment and I don't want to waste my life sleepwalking when every moment is precious. You know, we live very short times in the, on this planet, if you think about it. You know, even a healthy, good life, 70, 80, 90, 100 years, it's a flicker. It's over, like a flash. Why are we wasting it? When you say wasting it, 
what do you mean by wasting it? Uh, isn't everybody kind of going through life doing the best they can, uh, perhaps raising a family, going to work, having a little uh, celebration on the weekend, a little relaxation? Isn't that the way life works? That should be the way life works. How many people are doing that, by the way? How many people are instead being triggered by people and circumstance and social media and uh, conversations on the internet into um, predictable responses? We are predictable like algorithms, a bundle of conditioned reflexes and nerves constantly being triggered by people and circumstance into totally predictable outcomes. And uh, as we move into the future, we're becoming algorithms. There's no creativity. Once in a while, there's disruption, and then we have creativity. But overall, I think the things you mentioned are the things we enjoy, at least my, my generation as we were growing up. But right now, I, I see even children, digital natives that they're called, no reflection, no literature, they don't even know the classics. Even I talk to Nobel laureates. That is every uh, now and then I do interviews with Nobel laureates. They've discovered particles. They know gravity, waves. They know the fundamental nature of the universe, and yet they have never reflected on the deeper questions of the meaning of existence. Let me uh, take something from the book and have you react to it. If you're constantly looking forward to the weekend. You are either in the wrong job or compulsively working at the right job. Being compulsive at work will, over time, make you compulsive in the rest of your life. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, and, you know, I've seen people confuse their net worth with their self worth. And, uh, they're not happy. I find two categories of people who are extremely unhappy. One is the extremely poor because they need money for survival. And sometimes the extremely rich because they identify themselves with the money they have in the bank. And um, it's not a happy life. I, mm. I, you know, would you want on your deathbed to say, I wish I'd worked harder? Let's turn the equation a little sideways here. Uh, most people would say they want security, success, love, purpose, or meaning. You seem to suggest that most people are not getting those to the level that they could if they were more aware. Right. So you mentioned security. You mentioned um, success. You mentioned love, which are very important. But in Eastern wisdom traditions, there's a hierarchy that goes even beyond that, even beyond, say, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So survival and security is the first need. Um, the second is uh, sensual experience, because without sensual experience there, and, and joy, sensual experience, including sexuality, which is part of the Eastern wisdom uh, trad wisdom traditions, karma, they call it karma, not karma, but karma, which means pleasure. So the first is security, the second is pleasure, the third is um, transformation or control over your life, um, and the fourth is love. But then there's more than that, you know, after love is creative expression, then there's meaning, there's purpose, there's insight. There's transcendence. And if you look at the essential spiritual experience throughout history, East, West, it's three things. The first is transcendence. Nobody talks about transcendence. Finding an identity that's not in space time, which is your own being. Where, where is your own being at this moment? You know, when I ask you, where are you? People say, I'm here, but this is an experience in consciousness. So transcendence is number one. Second is the emergence of platonic values named after Plato, truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, love, compassion, joy, equanimity. And the third is the loss of the fear of death because that which is transcendent is not in space time. 
Now, this is the essential religious spiritual experience that ultimately becomes dogma, ideology, institutionalized, people go to war about it, but we've missed out on some of the greatest contributions of the greatest philosophers of all time, East and West, who've talked about what is of real value and purpose in our life. If you are in crisis or know someone who is, these resources offer immediate help. For information about This Is America and the World, visit our website, thisisamerica.net, or our YouTube channel, This Is America TV, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Underwriting for This Is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C., featuring the 29th National Japan Bowl, a Japanese language and culture competition, the National Association for Children of Addiction, Faces and Voices of Recovery, the Forerunner Foundation, the Rotondaro Family Trust, the Republic of Uzbekistan, the Sultanate of Oman, the Kingdom of Morocco, and the Embassy Series, Uniting People Through Musical Diplomacy.